for the debate. The uh, search for this week is organizing activities every afternoon from midday onwards. Today it's going to be a debate. Uh, the title will be Life is Better Without Belief in God. And we have two speakers, for and against. Uh, we have Dr. Michael Green from Oxford University. Um, and also from the humanities, we have um, Ramon Kassar, who will be speaking in this debate. Um, I hope you will enjoy, and they will have 12 minutes each for to start with. Then we have question time from the floor, and then they will have five minutes each to close up. Um, Ramon Kassar will be starting, okay? <laughs> Um, okay, first of all, this is Ramon Hassan, and uh, I am from the Humanist uh, Association of Malta. Um, I'm going to thank the Malta University Labour Group for this invitation. It's a very interesting debate. And to Michael being here for joining us today, as well as to all of you for attending. Um, I, I would like to point out initially the debate was going to be called Life is Better Without God. And I asked for the change because uh, it's, the question seems to assume that God exists and you're either on his side or you're not. Which is of course not my position. I, I'm a, an atheist, I do not believe in God, so that question would not have made much sense to me. Um, so either God exists, whether we believe in him or not, or God does not exist, whether we believe in him or not. So the real question is whether you believe or not, and whether that makes you live a better life. Um, we are immediately faced with something of a problem. What makes a better life? By whose standards? A hedonist might consider a better life as one which gives him the most uh, material pleasures. An altruist might consider an ideal life as one which helps others. Some theists might favor one which is dedicated to their religion, whatever that entails. There is no universal definition of a, uh, an ideal life. However, let's, let it, let's set aside this question for now. We'll come back to it later. Does belief in God, in God or its absence make life better? How does belief in God change a person's life? History from, from ancient to recent shows us many examples of people whose actions were greatly affected by their beliefs. This effect, however, has not always been good. Physicist and Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg said of religion, with or without it, you would have good people doing good things and even people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, that takes religion. We have extreme cases. We have suicide bombers who are explicitly inspired by their beliefs to do what they do. And we have less extreme cases, such as latent homophobia that is found in many belief systems. There are, of course, people who are either violent or homophobic independently of religion. However, I also know personally people who are kind, gentle, altruistic. And yet, if the topic of gay rights comes up, it's as if something changes. A switch goes off. They can't name a single civil right that they want to deny to same-sex couples, but they don't want them to marry anyway. The, re the only reason they have is that, according to their belief, God doesn't want this. Similarly, for millennia, women were accorded fewer rights than men, and equality has not yet been achieved. This is often justified by religion. <laughs> Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all have a history of oppressing women, and in some places this still happens. In many cases, the reason for this is that people believe that certain things are demanded by God, and therefore we should not question them. God is supreme. This is where religion differs from just about everything else. In science, in philosophy, even in politics, you can change your mind relatively easily. In politics, we have, in Malta, we had a party which was explicitly against joining the EU, a change in leader, and now we have a party that is in favor of being in the EU. And similarly, on the other side, we had a party which was very much confessional and religious, and with a change in leader, now it is less so. In, in religion, people are still opposing homosexuality because someone more than 3,000 years ago declared that God doesn't want it. 
So what if there was no religion? Should there would still be homophobic people, but there would be fewer. Those who are only homophobic because they believe their religion requires them to be Buddhists. How much easier would it be to reduce the spread of AIDS if the Catholic Church did not preach against the use of condoms? How much better would education in the USA be if there wasn't a multi-million dollar lobby undermining it to try to get creationism taught in state schools as a science? How much better would women be around the world if the Quran and the Bible did not say that men are superior? In Malta, how many people had to live a lie for decades until divorce was introduced, and the reason it wasn't introduced until recently was because of opposition in the religious, religious reason? And yet, I hear you say, many religious people do good things too. And this is true. But I believe that it is in the nature of most people to do good. I don't think that people do good only because they, they believe they'll be rewarded for it. They do it because it's the right thing to do. Religion, churches, provide the organization, the infrastructure for many charitable acts. But the charity happens because people care. It's a human thing. It's a product of our evolution that allows us to live as, as communities. Without religion, it would still happen. Maybe it, they might be a bit better because they would build more schools than churches. It is worth noting that countries that have a high percentage of atheists, together with modern democracy, seem to do very well in caring for their poor, not to mention having high standards of living. So, do we live a better life without belief in God? I am a humanist, and as such I believe in individual rights, in freedoms combined with responsibility and social cooperation. I believe that people can and will continue to find solutions to the world's problems so that quality of life can be improved for everyone. I believe that a life without a religious belief is the best way to achieve this, because we are not shackled by the requirements that we have to restrict ourselves to what a certain scripture says or what a certain church leader says. In conclusion, yes, I believe we do have a better life without a belief in God. Thank you. Now we have Dr. Michael Green, who will speak against the premise. Dr. Michael Green. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege to come to Malta on my first visit, and I'm thrilled to be here. Now, life is better without belief in God. It's a very fashionable idea these days. Even if you don't go as far as Christopher Hitchens, religion poisons everything, you may agree that the case for humanism is um, attractive, it's got real merit, and that life may well be better without belief in God. But I remain just a little bit uneasy about two words in the topic under discussion. Now, one is better, and the other is God. Let's take the God word first. We can easily assume that we all know what we mean by God, but do we? What sort of God are we talking about? The God who is a harvest tyrant? The God who forces people to obey him? The God who authorizes the slaughter of innocent people in Nairobi or Peshawar in very recent days? The God who is a human being playing an absolute power like uh, Stalin or Mao Zedong? The God who holds back the heart against the other guys on the The God who pats us on the head and says, there, there, um, you can do what you like, I don't mind. The God who started the cosmos off and then sat back and had no more to do. Well, the very contemporary God of sex and power, people have worshipped all these ideas of God. Let's throw them up. We're far better off without any religious belief at all. It's a very attractive position. But hang on, um, what about the origin of life and the universe? There are, I think, basically four questions you can ask, big questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why are there living things rather than just dead matter? Why are there complex living things and not just liquids? And why are there conscious thinking creatures, you and me, who bother to ask questions like that? Ah, you may say. Easy to answer that. Evolution. But evolution doesn't answer all those 
question. In fact, it only answers number three. Why are there complex living organisms, not just amoebas? It has nothing to say to the question, why is there anything at all? Oh, yes, it has, you say? The Big Bang. Ah, what made it go bang? And why was it so big? The universe seems to have sprung from something very powerful outside of space and time. And incidentally, that chimes in with what the Bible has to say about God. Eternal, uncaused, powerful, loving, and outside of space and time. Just suppose for a moment, just suppose that you were that sort of God. What might you do to show your hand to men and women who had said, I don't want to have anything to do with you? Well, you might start by creating a marvelous world and shout it out with the beauty and skill and power of the Creator. God has done that. You might create people um, capable of love, people with the dangerous gift of free will who could either respond to you or reject you. God has done that too. You can then go on to instill into the hearts of people the values which spoke of you, values like beauty and truth and creativity and goodness and speech and love. Wherever these are found, they would point to the Creator and His nature. They would be footmarks of God in the sand of our lives. Well, God has done that too. You might like the idea of building in a conscience which would approve when people chose the right way and would prod them and warn them when they chose the wrong way and went astray. God has done that as well. You could instill a God-shaped blank in their hearts, a hole which nothing else could fill apart from the living God himself, a space which cries out for satisfaction and fulfillment despite all the rubbish that we pile into it. Well, God has done that as well. And finally, you might conceivably come to this world in person. You'd have to come as one of them, of course, because if you disclosed yourself in all your radiant beauty, they would be blinded by the sight. It would be very costly. You'd have to love them an awful lot if you were going to shrink them yourself down to their level. It would be an almost unthinkable sacrifice. And yet, that is what the God I worship has done. The historical evidence for Jesus, God's coming into the world, is compelling. His quality of life shows what God is like. Radical, loving, holy, generous, forgiving, vibrant, winsome. We're no longer ignorant of the ideal for human life because the ideal has lived. And his name is Jesus. How could life be better? if we turn our backs on him. Well, remember, we're going to look at two words uh, in uh, our motion. I've said enough uh, about God, um, to show you what I mean by him, not an absentee despot, but the managing director who loves us enough to come down to the shop floor and get his hands not only dirty, but pierced. He's come to show us what life at its best could be like. And it's an immensely attractive picture. I would encourage you to grab one of the free copies of the Gospel um, in Maltese and uh, hanging around around the other place and just read the story of Jesus for yourself. But it's time to look at the other word in the motion, better. Do we mean that it's intellectually better um, not to believe in God, that it makes more sense? After all, being kind and generous and unselfish and so on uh, can be found in humanists just as much as believers, but sometimes more so. So why drag God in? The answer, I think, is fairly simple. If there is no God, if this world is all there is, then Dostoevsky is surely right in the Brothers Karamazov when he says, is there no God, then everything is permitted. Some humanists are kind and generous. Some are ruthless and corrupt. It is simply a matter of preference. Without God, there is no absolute standard by which we can begin to judge what is good and what is not. Hitler thought it good to liquidate six million Jews. That was his preference. Our preference might be different. 
but there is no scandal. It comes down to personal choice. And Richard Dawkins um, admits that, and he draws out the moral implications of unbelief in a blunt but very clear way. I quote, in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, any justice. The universe we observe has precisely those properties we should expect. There is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Well, Hitler danced to its music. And the 9-11 bombers danced to its music. There is no way we can blame them unless there is an absolute standard by which they can be judged. Surely Dostoevsky was right. If there is no God, then everything is permitted. He wasn't arguing that atheists don't do good things. He knows it, so do I. He was arguing that they do not have an intellectual foundation for morality. But perhaps by better, the motion means a morally better, not to believe in God. That would be rather hard to sustain. A vast amount of good is undertaken by believers who hope to gain nothing whatever from it. And they do it at great inconvenience to themselves because, uh, as Reverend can say, um, they know it's the right thing to do. To be sure, Christians have often been cruel, vicious, and violent, and I'm ashamed to have to say so, but I admit it, honestly. But why did they do it? Because they refused to follow the way of Jesus. You'll never find Jesus sanctioning violence against other people. On the contrary, he accepted violence against himself. Most Christians follow his example. This has been notable in Egypt recently, when Christians refused to retaliate when their pastors were shot and their churches were burnt down. Similarly, in Peshawar, in Pakistan, just a couple of weeks ago, 130 or so Christians were mown down when they were at worship. And the Christians did not retaliate. On the contrary, in recent decades, we've seen the most horrendous violence and misery inflicted by political leaders who rejected God. You only have to mention the names of Hitler with his liquidation of Jews and Gypsies and Christians, Stalin who slaughtered some 60 million people, most of them from his own country, Mao Zedong and Pol Pot. These atheist believers have been the main killers in our day. It's very hard to maintain that life is morally better when people don't believe in God. And of course, you might see better in a different life. Life is better without belief in God. Could mean not intellectually or morally. It could mean personally better, more fulfilling and satisfying. Dance becoming a Christian makes me more miserable. But it hasn't made me more miserable. And it hasn't made millions and millions of people uh, across the world. Um, the dentist to me listened to an unbeliever, Matthew Paris, who's an ex-MP in Britain and columnist for the London Times. He recently did a return visit to the Africa of his boyhood and he was simply overwhelmed by the liberation that Jesus Christ gives people and the better life that they enjoy. Christians, he writes, were always different. Their faith liberated and relaxed them. There was a liveliness, a curiosity, an engagement with the world, a directness, a dealing with other people that seemed to be missing in traditional African life. They stood tall. Wherever we entered the territory worked by missionaries, we had to acknowledge that something changed in the faces of the people, something in their eyes, something in the way they approached you, direct, man to man, without looking away. They were liberated. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ does set people free, and life is better, not only for Africans, but for us, when we put our life in his hands. Thank you. So we have a doctor in the so spare, do not spare any of your questions. Please go ahead.
I would love that if you have comments, you pass a comment, but at the end of the comment, we would like to have you say or address a question to one of the speakers, okay? Just say what you have to say and address it to one of the speakers, okay? Edwin? Why is it that when you look all over the world, in all societies, even in jungles, men seek a higher being? Uh, he asked, uh, why is it that all over the world, uh, including in jungles, men always seek a higher being? Is that right? There are many reasons why people uh, seek God, and uh, one of the reasons is that when you have something that you cannot explain, a phenomenon that you cannot explain, one good way of providing an explanation is to attribute it to a God. This has been the case in, in the Greek times. They thought that uh, lightning was cast by Zeus. In the Bible, we have the explanation that rainbows are placed in the sky by God to remind himself not to crown us all again. And I think that uh, this is one of the main reasons for uh, what people believe in the world. It's just something they could have explained. It. It's something big and powerful, like a volcano or an earthquake. And they say that must be a real powerful being who is angry. That's why the way to appease him, that, can, that becomes religion. I think that's one of the reasons why, yes, uh, people do seek a higher being to explain these phenomena that, that are so powerful, that are so much greater than us. And I think that is also one of the reasons why this, uh, these gods eventually get discarded as people learn what the real right, is behind the tongue. Uh, I think that most people here don't believe that rainbows are actually reminders for God because they don't have it for good and drawn from pain. And that's what the Bible So, one of the reasons is yes, they, have, they see something, they have no explanation, and they try to see, seek an explanation by, by uh, attributing agency to it. It's not just a natural phenomenon, it's a standing the 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 Tiny comment to that one. I quite agree that the seeking for God in the gaps is a disaster. Uh, my God is not in the gaps of human knowledge. He is behind the source of the whole shooting match. And um, it's very interesting to me that in a place like the United States, um, where um, you, 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 nobody jumped, or very few were asked. We were talking about some of the crazy loons there <laughs> earlier on. But, but, but basically, um, people who are, are thoroughly scientific and wouldn't dream of stuff about um, rainbows or jungles or whatever, um, they still believe in God. Um, and in fact, the belief in God is growing in the most highly sophisticated country in the world, where nobody could say it anymore that they uh, only believe because of God in the gaps. That would be the thing. Thank you. 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 When you take, when you say, you know, we don't know how the universe was started, what caused the bang? If you don't know what caused the bang, that's not a good reason to say, okay, then God did it. I mean, it may mean that we haven't found the reason yet. We're still searching. But it's very important to be able to say, I don't know. I don't know. Let's keep looking, rather than, I don't know. What's it been going on? I'm very happy with that. Um, this week is called The Search. And uh, let's poke our noses into it a bit and see what we make of it. Um, I'm very grateful for that observation. I think it was a very acute one. And um, the important thing is to be searching for the truth. Very interesting, to just a word about the Big Bang. Um, when that first came in, the prevailing scientific um, theory was a steady state, that the world has always been like that. And there were a, a tremendous amount of opposition from leading scientists when the Big Bang theory came in. Because it was too near the book of Genesis. It was too near that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Atmosphere, two and two. Next question. Yes, Dean, please. Can you stand up?
Nee, mit. diversity of religions and so on in the world. And I think I learned this, that man by himself cannot get up to God. He's going to have some ideas of God, God's goodness, God's perhaps ability to answer prayers. But he's not going to have, he's not going to be able to, how can the finite take in the infinite? How can the sinful take in the holy? It can't be done. So, God is working up to the time when he can come in person and show in the person of Jesus Christ what human nature is like. And that, I think, is the gradual revelation that we find in the Old Testament coming to its climax in the New. Thank you. I'm sure Reverend would want to say also. Well, I do agree that... Uh, I do agree that the process by which God supposedly uh, brought his word to us is very error-prone. Uh, I mean, the Gospels didn't start being written until many decades after Jesus had died. And then they were relying quite a lot on memory and on word of mouth. And then they had to be collected by a group of, of bishops in uh, 364 AD, I think, in the Nicaea to form what is now known as the Bible. And then that had to be translated into all the different languages. So consider how many places there are in which uh, I mean, better could be big. Uh, I think it would have been, if I, had, if I were God, I would have found a way to 
education in every country in the world receives an unedited, unchanged version in their language according to their local customs to make sure that nothing could possibly be misunderstood about my my uh, my will, my desire. Um, because the way this happens, you know, if you're a Maltese person, you're probably going to grow up a Christian. If you're a Saudi, you're probably going to be a Muslim. And all of these different ideas are often in conflict with one another. So how can God, who wants presumably all of humanity to get to him, have so many different messages? I do think that one of that is one of the, uh, the problems that religious people have to contend with, have to try to find an answer for. And my answer is, there is no God, but all of these commonalities come, come about because of our shared humanity. We all have an idea that we want to strive to, we want to be better than ourselves, we want to be as good as we can. And that idea, we uh, give a name to and we call it God, or Jesus, or Prophet. We are struggling towards that idea, but the source of that idea is ourselves as humans. Another question, uh, the guy in the front, tell me your name. Yeah, oh, you could come here. And... Uh, my name is Kevin Kassar, and uh, if you permit me, I have a two-part question. Um, first, uh, uh, Dr. Robert, Dr. Green spoke uh, about God showing himself through the creation through the creation. And uh, but I mean when when people talk about God uh, creating the stuff they only seem to talk about the beautiful stuff. They don't mention that every living creature on the planet uh, needs to eat another creature to survive. There are diseases, there are uh, earthquakes and whatnot. So did a loving God create all this? And if he didn't, uh, how can you tell what and what? And uh, my, my, the other part of the question is, uh, there are a lot of messages, like the, I mean, the scriptures, the Bible, the Quran, so um, they all claim to be the uh, revelation from God. So how can a, uh, an honest human person distinguish between what's true and what's not, and which one I mean, is, is, is the right interpretation or version? Very good. Two excellent questions there. Um, the way you can discern, I think, is to take um, a very long look at the one faith that claims that God has come in person to this world, and that is the Judeo-Christian faith, and to take a long look at what it says, the picture it gives of the person, the teaching, the lifestyle, the death, the resurrection of this person, and looking at that evidence, make up your mind. Uh, Nobody is compelled, but there is strong evidence. The first question, very difficult um, to uh, explain uh, both the, the anguish in the world and the beauty in the world. Um, uh, let me try a little analogy on you. Just supposing, and I do write books, just supposing I had uh, written a page of a book and you looked at it and you thought, well, I don't much agree with this chap, but I mean, he's perfectly sensible, I can understand what it means. And the bottom quarter was all full of crosses and squiggles and stuff. You would say, well, I don't know, a monkey got hold of a pen or something in the, the bottom quarter, um, or the person went completely off his nut. Um, but when you see that most of it is intelligent, you've got to try and say to yourself, well, um, there is intelligence, but I don't understand that bottom quarter. And when I look at this broken world, it's marred in every area, I see so much that's beautiful and good and true, but I see so much that is horrible and broken and marred. The biblical explanation for this, you don't have to believe it, but this is the, I think the only explanation that to me makes sense of both the beauty and the horror, is that the world is not as God made it. God made it very good. But humankind has somehow 
before humankind from goodness, so that goodness and badness both jostle in the human breast. That has somehow affected the climate that we live in. We see that a little bit in the way um, uh, the, 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 the actual physical climate is being wrecked by a human misuse of freedom. And the Bible says that is the basic cause of the trouble that we are in. So the world is not as it was created quite. It's not as one day it will be, because Christianity has a great hope. But at the moment, it's marred. It's beautiful, but it's marred. And we need to live in that world and to try and do as much as we can uh, for the sake of the beautiful. Uh, Michael Green mentioned that he only can think of one explanation, but he did mention another earlier on, which is where Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, mentioned that if there is no God, then it's not the intention of the earthquake to kill so many people. It's not the intention of the lightning to hit that tree. It just happens to be that in the, in the, in the nature of lightning to cause damage to whatever it strikes. We are the intelligent beings. We have to make sure that we avoid lightning uh, earthquake prone areas. We have to take precautions against storms. The, the, what we call uh, evil is rather natural disasters that we have to use our own abilities to avoid, or if we cannot avoid them, to make uh, to, to fix them. If, if, uh, if there is a, an earthquake, we have to be willing to go over there to help the people there. Uh, then ask ourselves, why did God do this to us, or why did God permit this to happen to us? These things happen because we are living on a planet which has certain characteristics, certain storms, certain uh, tectonic movements, and these cause these consequences that we have to work our lives around. And so, uh, that is the, the other way of We have only time for one short question, it has to be very concise. I'll try to be very short. My question is for Mr. Ramon. I would like you to give your comment uh, on the thing you started your speech with the question does believe in God make life better? And we know that many people uh, say that they experience that believe in God does make life better. For example, I'm coming from former communist country. Two-thirds of my life I was an atheist. At age 28 I became believer. And I can say that, that before then I became believer that I was very angry, that my moral standards were not very high when I thought that I'm a good guy. And since I became Christian, my God really transformed my life and made it better. So what would be your comment to the witness of many people whose lives God did change? Thank you. Um, I, I, I certainly agree that a person can ex a, a, a person can experience something that changes their life for the better. Personally, my experience has been the other way around. I was raised from a very young uh, age as a Christian, and I feel I feel that I am better now that I am an atheist. Uh, but obviously, different people can have different experiences. In your case, you were living in a communist country, possibly had a number of privileges, a number of problems that made your life more difficult. And at the same time as changing towards Christianity, you also got more freedoms in your own, in your own life. And that is one possible reason. But anything can cause a person's life to be better. A person can read a book. It doesn't have to be a religious book. It can be a book that affects them so profoundly, or see a film that affects them so profoundly that their life becomes better as a result. I've known people who, uh, whose lives were changed for the better through music. So any, anything can affect the individual in a different way. And uh, it could be that, yes, Christianity has made your life better. And it could be that uh, some, for somebody else, it's not made your life better from Christianity. I know people who said that, they were Christians, they became Muslims, and they said that now I feel better. Now, I, I feel I feel better as an atheist because it's as if certain restrictions, certain shackles were removed from me, and I had the freedom to intellectually pursue what I feel to be the best way forward without having to deal with what the Bible says, what the Quran 
Fall sehe ich, wollte Fall das sehe. Dazu tue ich mein Internet zu vorwärts. Habt ihr es eigentlich gesagt, wenn ihr den Virtual Basis für die Kommentare bei Different Things that made their life I think a woman wants to ask a short question. It has been very short. This lady here, you. Uh, thank you try and shorten it a bit. Um, with regards to religion being good for the world, um, I have many aspects to bring up, but perhaps the one most obvious to me living in a Christian, heavily Christian environment is, is it really healthy to tell people that they are sinful, they need the divine to be pure? To tell children that, to need them to be baptized, you know? Um, it seems rather cruel. And speaking on just, I mean, I'm from psychology, I can imagine, you know, what you're telling a child constantly, you know, you are the bad thing, you need to improve, God is perfect, even though technically God himself committed mass genocide, you know, in, in the Bible. Um, perhaps, sorry, another short point, why Christianity, why the Christian God? I have no time whatever for telling children that they are bad repeatedly. And in fact, when children are nourished in loving, generous homes, they generally grow up into loving, generous people. Uh, I would go further. I would say I have no time for religion. Religion can be absolutely disastrous. And Jesus Christ came to destroy religion. Religion is like a set of steps to try and climb up to the divine. And Jesus came and kicked those steps away and said it cannot be done. The only hope is a rope through the ceiling and somebody swinging down to show you what is up there. And that, I believe, is what has happened. So much for that question. We need to move on, I guess, now to the conclusion. We have closing round of, question, of um, speakers. Uh, now, Michael Green, Dr. Michael Green will start. You have five minutes. And then Ramon will have the reply. Okay? And conclude the comments from there. Michael. This is going to be continuing every day this week. Um, short talk on the advertising topic. Uh, Wednesday, for instance, we'll pick up uh, earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, so there'll be a chance every day to come here and you see there's characters in blue shirts with the thing called the search on them. There we are, there's one of them over there, there's one of them up here. Um, they'd be people who they're committed Christians and they'd be very happy to pick up questions. Um, and I see there's lots of unanswered questions today. Um, grab a blue shirt and go talk to it. Now my conclusion is this, that we've done a fair amount of arguing about whether or not it's better to believe in God. I want to end, not with an argument, but with three examples of people I know personally. One is Chuck Colson, once a profound skeptic, a gifted but very unpleasant lawyer, who rose to became special counsel to President Nixon. He was utterly ruthless and self-centered. One night he had supper with Tom Phillips, a friend who challenged him about his lifestyle and about his skepticism. You're a little bit skeptical. Can I do anything for you? Sorry, sorry. It's all happy now. Okay, good. Skepticism satisfied. Great. The search was coming up, up the avenue. Anyhow, this guy had supper with um, Tom Phillips, who challenged him about his lifestyle and gave him a slim book to read. It was called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And it led him to Christ. Shortly afterwards, the Watergate scandal erupted. He was involved in it, he pleaded guilty, he went to prison where his Christian faith blossomed. When he came out, he began a life's work of such significance that he is arguably the most effective social reformer of the 20th century. Finally, the prison 
fellowship movement, which is the most passionate outreach to prisoners in the world, now works in more than a hundred countries. I once spoke to a conference that he ran for his leading leader, almost all of whom had previously been prisoners, some of them actually rescued from death row, such as the American system. Um, and, um, all of them had had their lives turned round by Jesus Christ. And the joy and the confidence in God, which I saw on this group of over a thousand men at the conference, is something that's witnessed still. There is no doubt that they, like Jesus Christ himself, have found life infinitely better. The gospel changes lives in the way which religion doesn't. And the lives of countless thousands who continue to meet Christ through their ministry are still being changed by prison fellowship. The second person I read to you is a man called Paul Tarrant. He too is a skeptic, he's an anti semite he was a terrorist. He was full of violence and hatred. He was profoundly opposed to um, desegregation in the American South in the 60s. By the age of 21, as a fully fledged member of the Ku Klux Klan, actually, in the white Knights, which were the most dangerous wing of the clan. He took part in some 30 bombings of churches, synagogues, and homes. He was captured in a shootout of the FBI police, in which his partner was killed, and he himself almost died after having been bullets. He was sentenced to 30 years in one of the roughest prisons in the state. With limited reading material available, he began to examine the Gospels. He was haunted by the words of Jesus. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And alone in his cell, he entrusted his broken life to Christ, and the transformation was very soon apparent. He renounced his membership of the clan, and his deep seated characteristic of hatred changed into one of gentleness and love. He's actually one of the most gracious and gentle men that I know. After release from prison, he trained for Christian ministry. He was ordained and he devoted himself to Christian social work, particularly among the poor blacks in Washington, D.C. I think you'll find it very hard to persuade him that life is better when you don't believe in God. And the third person I bring you is Jackie Collinger, a very ordinary young woman, until she discovered the life transforming power of Jesus Christ. Fresh out of music college, she wanted to be a missionary, but none of the societies would take her. Eventually, at the age of 22, she gathered together her savings and bought a one-way boat ticket, hilariously, without knowing quite where she was going to go. But it would be as far as her finances allowed her to travel. And that turned out to be Hong Kong, where she knew nobody and she had no resources. So she started to teach music and to care for the desolate young people around Soon, her attention was drawn to the walled city, six acres and a half of Kaloon, which was densely populated and was controlled by criminal gangs, particularly the much feared triad. Even the police did not dare to enter the walled city, except when they carried out raids in large groups. And many such raids took place. About 2,500 criminals were arrested over the years, and over 40,000 tons of drugs. But nothing changed in the criminal nature of the walled city. It was a terrible place, full of human trafficking, prostitution, money laundering, counterfeiting, contract killing. Massive drug dealing and murder. And Jackie Pulitzer sailed courageously into this hell unaccompanied. And she showed her care for the residents by countless acts of kindness. Once they realized that she was there to stay, they began to open up to her. Addicts discovered that they could come off heroin, cold turkey, when concentrated prayer was made for them. The criminals of all sorts came to faith. The Hong Kong government was highly impressed and gave her a building where recovering gang members and prostitutes and drug addicts were rehabilitated. Not with medicine, but cold turkey accompanied by intense prayer offered by 
at its adherence. By 2007, it was caring for 200 inmates, and several thousand addicts have been set free, and uh, she continues to live out in Hong Kong. The walled city, ladies and gentlemen, is no more. Its walls have been taken down, the lives of its inhabitants have been changed, and now it is a pleasant part. Jackie Poynish is one of the most famous missionaries in the world and one of the most unassuming. But I can assure you that if she was here today, she would want you to know that life is by no means better without belief in God. It is that belief which has utterly transformed one of the most evil places in the world. If you really think that life is better without belief in God, I would suggest to get on an airplane and fly to North Korea. Very atheistic and not very happy. That would be my suggestion. Thank you. at school, I must have been around six years old, I think. I had my first doubt in religion. The teacher had just told us a very simple and uh, common belief in Christianity. You have to be a Christian to go to heaven. And I was shocked. I was shocked because a few months earlier, I had been collecting big beans and other things of as as Ethiopia in those days to people who had never heard of Jesus. And I thought, and I reflected, and I said, hold on, so those kids that we follow no Christian kids for are going to hell? And I knew it was wrong. The teacher asked someone and said, no, no, they won't go to hell, they'll go to limbo. Because that was still in the Catholic uh, teachings in those days. And that didn't shut me up, but it didn't satisfy me. I knew it was still wrong. I knew it was wrong that I should go to heaven because I happened to be born in Malta. And those guys happen to be born in hunger and thirst and disease and so on, would live a very short life and then not get better than I was getting. Because they deserve better than I did. I knew they had the age. And I think that was one of the, it was the first time that I had ever challenged what I had been, uh, what was being taught. Exactly. I didn't become an atheist then, but throughout the years I had many more doubts about things that the might have been taught. And uh, which we are required to have seen the first time. But why did God punish the first time? Uh, 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 or why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Were there any children there who were innocent? Any women? I mean, okay, there were this group of people who were about to rape the angels. They deserve punishment, but not all the others. Why did they have to die? When they were leaving uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and God's uh, wife turned back to to look, to look at, you know, her neighbors, her friends, who were screaming as they were being burned alive, and she got turned into a girl. So, how is that moral? What kind of morality is, is being taught by this so, Even if you go to the New Testament, where, which is a great improvement because even Jesus realized that these things were in the Old Testament were not quite right and tried to change them. He passed no sin, passed the first stone. He was trying to change the world here, but even from then until today, things have changed further. In the, in the New Testament, we have Saint Paul telling the slaves, obey your masters as if you are obeying God. What kind of moral teaching is that? And this is in the New Testament. Jesus may not have been a violent person, but he did tell his followers to sell their clothes and buy swords. He did say, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. He said, he came to, to set uh, children against their parents and against each other. So, as I see it, the Bible is just a thick book in which you can find verses to support any position you care to, to have. If you want to be violent, the Bible is full of violence. Can use to, God says this, this prophet says that. If you want to be a good person, the Bible also has good verses. But how do we decide which are the good verses and which aren't? We do decide because many of these stories you will not hear in churches. You will not hear in the, in the, uh, in the Sunday Mass about how Jesus cursed a uh, victory. What has he got? What has he got? He sticks. 
we don't care about it because someone decided this is not really a good story to be teaching people. And if humans are deciding from the Bible which are the good bits and which are the bad bits, then it is humans who are the source of morality and of the Bible. The Bible just provides verses so that you can say, God said this, it has the authority of God, but we are the source of morality and as I forgot, I forgot the name of this, uh, this Greek uh, philosopher before Jesus. He said, man is the measure of all things. Thank you. I would like to thank both speakers, Ramon and uh, also Michael. It was interesting, interesting for me. I hope it was interesting also for you all. And there were pretty good uh, contributions to knowledge. You might want to discuss further with some of our members of the team or with, some, with the speakers themselves later on. And I would like to remind you that this is not over. We have a week of activities going on. This is um, the first day, Monday, tomorrow, same time, up until the end of the week, Friday. We, we will always have activities from midday till one. Tomorrow, yes, Michael Green will uh, speak about um, God limiting our sex life and pleasures. This will be an interesting talk from midday onwards. And in the evening, today, there will be activity, another activity. Um, I believe it's music, right, Jeff? At 8 p.m. in the evening, there will be a number of bands and artists playing some of their own music as well. So it will be a good time for you to enjoy music with us and fellowship. Uh, Ramon, you wanted a comment? I just, want, I just wanted to say uh, the Monte Humanist Association is uh, planning to set up a university branch uh, for humanists. Uh, we might be a little fresher to be able to understand, but uh, we are planning on uh, having a meeting pretty soon uh, on campus to set up this organization. Those who are interested, uh, the best way to get hold of us is either on our website, waterhumanist.org, or seek us out on Facebook, Water Humanist Association. And to stick around to talk, please do so. We have people in blue shirts who would love to talk to you.